Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, no matter where you are, I hope you are all well. And welcome to Architects Fast Forward webinar series. My name is Crystal, a MASA representative, and I'll be your master of ceremony for today. Firstly, I would like to thank Architects 2021 for giving MASA an opportunity to conduct this session. We are pleased to have this collaboration with Architects. For those who have yet to hear about MASA, I hope you can lend me your ear as I explain further. MASA stands for Malaysia Architecture Students Alliances, and it is a non-profit student committee operating directly under Pertubuhan Architect Malaysia, or PEN, consisting of student representatives from all architecture institutes of Malaysia. It is a platform where Malaysian architecture students join forces to learn and share where appreciation of the past, generating sustainable living in the present, and bringing unlimited possibilities to the future. Our mission is to develop an effective platform between Malaysian architecture students and professionals. We also serve as liaisons between students and PEM. All right, let's proceed to our main agenda by introducing our special guest for today. We present to you once again, the chairman of PEM Education Committee, architect Ajanta Aziz, and the one and only Tantri architect Esa Muhammad, who will be talking to us on the topic, planning and urban design process for architecture. To begin with, let us welcome architect Ajanta to say a few words. <laughs> Hi, Hi, Crystal. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon. <laughs> How are you, How Crystal? Are you? I'm, I'm well. Good. How about you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. How's your study? My studies, um, I've just started, so uh, things are a little bit, you know, unsure there. Yeah. But right, yeah, we're right. going great. Okay, Thank cool. you. I'm so right. proud of you. We are so proud of you because you, you know you're doing your study, but you can spend time with us today, and we are so proud of you. Thank you so much, all the way from UCTS Cebu. If yes, I'm not mistaken, yeah, yes. Crystal. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Thank you thank so you much, so Crystal. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Okay. Well. All right. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Good afternoon. My name is Architect Adrian Ta Aziz. On behalf of PAM Education Committee. I would like to wish welcome everyone to Architects Fast Forward Special. Today's special day, 7 of October, year 2021, organized by MASA, Malaysian Architecture Student Alliance, and supported by PAM, Pertubuhan Architect Malaysia, Malaysian Institute of Architect, and also from Acacia uh, Committee, Architectural Education, and then supported by PAM and CIS under digital platform Architex Online. So today we have a special uh, session uh, today that I'm so honored and so happy to bring you Tan Sri Architect uh, Town Planner, Datuk Sri Isa Muhammad. He's an award-winning architect and planner who is the founding director of Architect Juru Rancang Malaysia, Sinan Berhad AJM and AJM Planning and Urban Design Group, Seren Berhad, APUDG. As the past president of Pertubuhan Architect Malaysia, PAM, and the current chairman of my HSR Corporation, Seren Berhad, his major planning and architecture works includes, but not limited, to the Subang Jaya Township, Kuala Lumpur Master Plan, Putrajaya Master Plan, KLIA Master Plan and Terminal Buildings, Mid Valley City, Kuala Lumpur, and major works in China, Pakistan, and Saudi Arabia. Well, with his first class honors and university gold medal in Bachelor of Architecture, Master in Town and Country Planning from University of Newcastle and Sydney, he has received additional prestige or rewards such as Aga Khan Award for Architecture, PAM Gold Medal. Board of Architects Malaysia Presidential Medal, Balai Iktisas Malaysia Professional Excellence Award in Engineering, Construction and Property, and the Australian Distinguished Alumni Award. Well, ladies and gentlemen, students, with this talk title today, Planning and Urban Design Process for Architecture, we would explore deeper knowledge regarding planning and urban design. Well, the history of human civilization is manifested by monuments and relics of the past. 
for all of them, we still can't understand how and why they exist. We are fascinated by them where theories and speculations evolved on how they came into time being. What is evident was that they all had to do with the behavior of how the people lived and humidity. So a pattern then evolved and became a master plan that revolved around one or sometimes a few iconic structures with unique architecture that perhaps were governed by religious belief or supernatural forces. Hence, planning morphed into architecture that existed for millennia. And today, the culture, physical, and super spiritual connections between architecture and planning still exist with blurred boundaries. Well, today, ladies and gentlemen, students especially, with his talk title today, Planning an Urban Design Process for Architecture, Tan Sri Architect Isa Muhammad will be illustrating the planning process and how creativity and architecture evolve on the urban scale. But the question now, how do we accommodate new sciences and theories about the environment and humanity for a symbiotic coexistence? So without further ado, so let's welcome uh, Tan Sri, Datuk Sri, Architect Isa Muhammad. Assalamualaikum Tan Sri. Waalaikumsalam. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ajanta, for the welcoming remarks. And uh, I would like to thank the uh, architects for inviting me to speak today to all the right. students. And uh, I, I hope that what I will say, you know, will be of use, hopefully. <laughs> anyway. Inshallah, inshallah. First of all, thank you so much again, Tansri, with your contribution and your time, especially. I know we have a tight schedule, but we are yeah. so honored to have you. It's a pleasure. So without further ado, Tansri, I pass the floor to you now. Please. Thank you. <clears throat> Bismillah rahman rahim Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa ta'ala wa barakatuh. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, thank you again, Akdex and Adyanta and the team for inviting me. It's a real pleasure and honor for me to be given this opportunity to talk to all of you. Uh, that's basically just, uh, Adyanta is given a full rundown of who I am and what I do. Um, AJM is, uh, is an architectural firm and we have uh, also a sister company, APDG, uh, AJM Epidology has offered quite a number of services, quite broad services. We are, I think, not mistaken now, I think we are about 43 years old. <laughs> we have completed thousand of projects, you know, reports and uh, planning studies, uh, buildings, what have you. And uh, we have something like 200 active clients. Uh, we yeah, are also in done work in some 15 countries. So we, uh, we are very happy that um, even at this point in time, and uh, we have still some work overseas uh, and some locally. Uh, hopefully, uh, post pandemic, things will get better for all of us, and uh, we will be able to to continue with our lives as usual. You know, you know when, when we talk about planning and architecture, I remember when I was a student also, we, we studied history and, you know, of human civilization. And uh, I, I remember looking at a book, Minister Fletcher, which is a history of architecture. And we, we yearned to look at all these spaces and over the years, I've had the opportunity to go to some of these places, and it amazed me. This is Machu Picchu, and uh, also the fortress in Cusco, Sasakuman, in Peru. Uh, we had the opportunity to go there, and uh, it's an amazing, you're one of the seven wonders of the world. Uh, you look at the kind of 
architecture and the the technology that they had then was is is amazing, and we just I I, well, I just can't imagine how things were done, how they carried all these huge blocks of stone and and the the joints are just so immaculate. You know, is I don't think the technology that we have now is able to compete, and um, the same thing here when we we had an opportunity to go there in Lakso and cut to look at this relics in Kanak temple and, and is uh, the architecture and the, 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 the structure itself is so amazing. And um, by the way, we had a, we had our International Union of Architects Council meeting this uh, on the Nile and we dropped by to have a look at this place. And it is actually, uh, you know, a temple and uh, around it became settlements and that's how human civilization evolved. Uh, and then of course we've also had the opportunity to look at this Alhambra, you know, the the climax of the Islamic empire in, in Europe. Uh, the, the fine work as compared to the very robust uh, architecture that you, you you saw in the previous slides, uh, this very refined, very tasteful, and very uh, immaculate work is something beyond compare even to this day. And uh, the the awareness about environment and and, and landscape and, and greenery is so prevalent in this in this place and it's so peaceful um so here we are from there you know let's see what we can do here we have a my topic today is about planning and urban design process for architecture we have done quite a number of studies and planning and and, and work uh on the right on the top left hand corner is the is the Rubber Research Institute land, which I will talk about it later. And of course, the Tung Raja Exchange, the master plan, which we were involved. And on the right, top right hand corner is a, is a, is a smart city in, in, uh, in Uganda. And of course, we were involved in the master planning of uh, Trajaya. We're still doing some work there in, in uh, doing some up, updating work for the master plan. And uh, one of the biggest projects that we have done is the Mid Valley City in, in the middle bottom row. And of course, the KL International Airport. When we planned the KL International Airport, it was designed for, two, for 100 million passengers per year in projected to be in 2050. But I think he has almost touched that, you know, recently before COVID. Um, so there we go. In Malaysia, there are three levels of government. Uh, the federal, and it, I think it's quite common in the Commonwealth countries. The, we have this, federal government, we have the state government, and also we have the local government, the local authorities. Some local authorities, the council members are elected, but some are appointed, like in Kuala Lumpur, is, uh, they are appointed. So, but apart from that, if we look at the way planning is being done in this country, you have the plan, and then you have the national physical plan, which is a federal thing. And then we, we have a regional plan. Regional plan is actually uh, plans for regions that has been identified. For example, we have the southern region, Iskanda. We have the northern region, uh, which is uh, Kedah, Perak and Penang together. And then we have the Eastern region, the East Coast states. And of course we have Sabah and Sarawak. 
And these are governed by uh, a separate act, which is actually the, uh, the Regional Planning Act. And the whole, the whole uh, planning process is governed by the Town and Country Planning Act. So at the, at the, at the national level, you have the phys National Physical Plan, and then at the state level, you have the State Structure Plan, and then you have a local plan, and then you have the Action Area Plan. So this local plan and action area plan are more detailed as opposed to the structure plan. This is a system that has been adopted uh, in the early 70s. So this is my urban design manual. One is to understand the site. Second is to have visioning and ideation. And the third one is to develop principles and strategies and fourth is to develop a concept master plan. And finally, the implementation strategy. It is very important for us when we start off to understand the site itself, which is the key for formulating the correct strategies. The understanding could range from specific, site specific to its regional context its physical features, microclimate, connectivity, communities, and depending on the scale of the project and how it would impact the master plan. Of course, the surrounding developments, infrastructures, whether it's a transportation network and other unique features have to be accounted. Um, like uh, the second one, we start visioning the ideas at this stage, the master plan's big ideas are being developed to determine the overarching development direction. Engagement with stakeholders at all levels, whether it is private or public, they are crucial as a holistic, holistic understanding leads to a better solution to be proposed. The main strategic role and function of the development zones have to be established. Thirdly, we have to develop principles and strategies. The overall vision and development direction will be translated specially uh, to ensure that it captures all the principles and intentions in the physical design of the master plan. And then we develop the concept. Sometimes the concept is drawn after having through, going through all the earlier steps the concept master plan is indeed a result of careful, holistic thinking, providing answers and solutions to the issues in the new development direction. Um, it could also compel you to start thinking about the form. Sometimes you might want to think about whether the water features uh, that is there is already on site, uh, the point that you want to develop as nodes or, or fo fo focus for your axis, these are all part of the process of the uh, concept master planning drawings that you are embarking on to. And then of course, finally, the implementation strategy itself. The planning initiative goes beyond the conventional master planning. It has to be unique. A township or a township or a district that are different from other developments through value added features, performance and quality features that enhance the regulations and development control. The development phasing and financial modeling options are also formulated including the urban design guidelines itself, which provide you the actual guidelines in terms of building plot ratios, setbacks, and things like that. So I just like to take as an example here. This is a project, which is a site, which is about 2,257 acres. 
is a very strategic site. Just outside of the Kuala Lumpur boundary, you can see the regional map of Kuala Lumpur there. The one in brown on the top is the the uh, zone, this is which is Kuala Lumpur. Followed the middle one is Putrajaya, the administrative capital, and Cyberjaya, and of course the KL National Airport. And you can see all the highways that link this project to all the other uh, very important destinations. Uh, the one in red spot is the right in the heart of Kuala Lumpur is the location of the Tunraza Exchange. So, in terms of your regional positioning, it is a greenfield site and there is an opportunity for us to showcase a sustainable township and community living. You know, they, at the moment, we are signatory to the new urban agenda. The 17 sustainable goals is, uh, it is in our, our objective. So, it appears that a lot of new development and urban design uh, also accommodating the requirement for sustainability. Um, so the, the land that we have over here is so strategic and it'll be, it'll be really unfortunate if we don't take into account the requirement of the sustainability goals. So this is the process and procedures that we have taken. And uh, in terms of its location, as I said earlier, you can see how strategic it is. And the land has now been acquired by the, the uh, Employers Provident Fund, uh, EPF, and is we won a competition for this, actually. And this is how we started planning. Based on the menu I had earlier, the overall land use structure has been guided by first determining the physical features, the highland and lowlands, the natural waterways, and then the committed and existing infrastructure. We have the MRT line that connects uh, this area to Kajang. Uh, we have a new highway which is under construction, the Damansara and uh, Highway, Shah Alam Highway. And it is peculiar also because the land is divided into two portions. One is under the municipality of Shah Alam. The other one is the the municipality of Petaling Jaya. So we have had a bit of issue because the one in Petaling Jaya has taken so long to get approval, but the one at the top has been approved much earlier. And because there are so many surrounding developments that we had to take into account the, the surrounding developments and uh, to ensure that the whole development later on will fit in into the whole scenario. So, in terms of vision, we wanted to make this as the bio pole for the 21st century, taking into account the requirement of biodiversity and to make sure that the community are exposed to the kind of ecosystem and biodiversity that we could develop. Because the land is a clean, a virgin green land. Uh, it used to be part of the Rubber Research Institute, and which is this portion here. And um, so the principle is that we establish the natural water courses and Perhaps this could become uh, a dedicated 
flat plane. And then along that, we can have the ecological corridor. And we can then punctuate it with recreational area for protection. And then allow good permeability for the public to access these areas and establish nodes for catalytic development. And these are the principles that we, we, we adopt and to look at how we can make the plan flexible and holistic. So main thing is to make sure there is connectivity throughout the site, also green and also inclusive. So that is the overall concept master plan. We have developed the blue zone here with all the water features that goes right through the site from the north to the south. And, uh, and then we end up with having lakes that could be used for recreational and also enhance the overall development. So these are the open spaces that has been preserved. So we talk about connectivity, we talk about the integrated or integration of transportation network, having pedestrian priority city and walkable neighborhood, and also to make sure that ICT infrastructure is, is, is available. And then as far as the greenery is concerned, we have we plan to enhance the ecology, creating green density, uh, neutralizing carbon emission, uh, green development component, green travel plan, green infrastructure, and also of course green buildings. So that becomes the eco belt. And as far as public transport is concerned, all these nodes are stops for the public transport. So it is very, very accessible and permeable. And as I said earlier, this is a blue corridor that we will retain and then we develop communities around it. Earlier on, there was a proposal by the MRT, Basarana, we had to negotiate with Pasarana to see whether we could drag or relocate or amend the alignment of the MRT line to come into the site so that we have stations within the site which could then be developed into transit oriented development. So we have managed to do that and it has cost a client an additional cost of 90 million. Uh, because at the top of the site is where the depot of the MRT line is. So which is over here. So that's being developed and it's being constructed. The whole line is now under construction. So here we go. As I said earlier, it's a model community township in Malaysia in driving the nation's commitment for global reduction of carbon emission and efficient use of energy. So we have now got a lot of open space, uh, total about 13.8%, 315.96 9, acres of open space. Uh, that includes roof garden, plaza, and neighborhood park, local park, and uh, other linear park, youth park, wetland park, and the Central Hill Park here. So for every residential block, um, we require 10% of it to be used for greenery and for commercial development, 5%. So for inclusiveness, we have mixed income housing, diversity in housing types, and creating a well-balanced community. So 40% of the development 
will be for affordable and mixed income housing. And we make sure that it is a walkable city. Uh, 15 minutes for people to walk to the community facilities and amenities. So we want to discourage the use of private vehicles, encourage more the use of public transport. So the area will become cleaner and less polluted. So here we are, the final zoning plan that's been used for the development and submission to the local authority. This white portion here is the land which belongs to the Rubber Research Institute, which they require to be excised from the whole development for their purpose. So total area is 2,257 acres and we have Residential, 37%, about 856 acres. Commercial, 10%. Mixed use, 10%. Public amenities, 9. Open spaces, now 11%. And infrastructure, another 20%. So that was my first example of what we are doing. The next one is the master plan of the Tun Razak Exchange. Now, um, we were involved with this master planning, uh, I think in 2011. 2011, we were involved. And now it is already under construction. Um, we are not involved in the construction or any of the buildings, but we were involved in the actual master planning. And um, we were involved together with uh, MSA, Mercado Severity, Severity Associates out of Boston. And uh, Grant Associates was the, uh, I think was a landscape architect. Uh, they were local engineering, EDP consultant, and the building traffic, uh, classic, and uh, putting NFL for costing. And uh, also Arup was involved, Arup Liu Kunding. Then Essential looking at all the uh, uh, IT and digital requirements and uh, KEO International. Um, basically, the whole idea is that in the overall master plan of KL 2020, there are five goals. One, to enhance the role of Kuala Lumpur as an international, commercial, and financial center. Secondly, is to create an efficient and equitable city structure. Thirdly, to enhance the city living environment. Four, to create a distinctive city identity, identity and image. And the final one is to have an efficient and effective governance. Kuala Lumpur is growing very, very fast. And uh, in keeping with the national economic development and continuing urbanization, uh, there is a flow of people and money to the city that contributes to expanding demand and, and also for buildings. So we have to have innovative urban, urban regeneration. We have to have new trends in design of the built environment. We need uh, class A buildings with the latest technologies to replace the existing aging building blocks or building stocks. Uh, we have to incorporate sustainable features, green buildings, and also planning. All this led to the conceptualization of Kuala Lumpur International Financial District to create 
an international quality environment for the financial industry and the combination of, of the leisure associated with it and to connect this district physically and psychologically to the city. This is a site which is approximately about 70 odd acres. Uh, it's a vacant site then um, on the very low end of the city. Uh, on the top there you can see here, this is the, the Royal Salomon Golf Course or Golf, Golf Club. The only green portion in the center of the city, which is actually a golf course. And uh, it's traversed by this main highway, which is at Jalan Tun Abdul Raza. And then there's this road here, highway here now, which is uh, Jalan Kamung Pandan. And you can also have from the south, the Maju Expressway. So the site offers a very tremendous advantage of having direct vehicular connection from all these highways. The only thing that challenges that we face is that difficulty of assessing it from this highway, Tung Raza, and also from here. The adjacent neighborhood is still fairly undeveloped over here, all fairly undeveloped, some they are old houses. And uh, the idea is to sort to capitalize on the advantages offered by the site and to minimize the deficit. So it has to be self-contained and highly connected and generate a profound catalytic effect on development of the existing neighborhoods in the north over here and also the west of the site over here, which is Jalan Bukit Bintang. So if you look at the location of the site, this is the site. This is KLCC, and uh, which is about one kilometer away. It's about 15 minutes walk. Uh, this is uh, Central Market. Uh, and uh, this is the transport hub at KL Central. And the new one coming up here, which is uh, PNB 118, the Medica Square project here. And there's another one here, which is actually a very big project that has been planned. Uh, which also belongs there to, to the Ministry of Finance. Um, this is the old uh, airport uh, and army base that has been relocated and has been designated as a new center for development to cater for the expansion of the population in Kuala Lumpur. Um, this will be the main terminal for the high-speed rail as well. So a lot of transit, quite a number of, of rail lines are going through here. The MRT lines are going through here and the high-speed rail going through here. The ERL is going through this spot. So this is going to be a real transportation hub. So you're looking at the site, how do we integrate it? So you can see, I mentioned to you earlier, Jalan Tun Raza, how to bring these vehicles to come in here. And there's already a plan, also completed now, this line, the MRT line that goes to, to Kajang. And there's already a station here. So that's, how strategic the, the, the plot of land is, is divided. There are two portions, the northern portion and the southern one. This is the 
Jalan Kampung Pandan that cuts the site into two. So we have to have a connection, a seamless connection between these two, a pedestrian connection. So this is the Bukit Bintang area, very vibrant, Jalan Bukit Bintang, which is very vibrant. This is the pavilion. And we plan to connect the pedestrian connection from here all the way up to Jalan Bukit Bintang. And all these areas will all be open up. The Jalan Sultan Ismail, there's a there's an LRT line here, right? And there's a station there. So if you can recall, this is the uh, Times Square. And further down is the new uh, Bukit Bintang city center, the old prison is located here, which is being developed into a new commercial hub. So you can see how the whole area will now be fully uh, developed. And this development here will become a catalyst and it has to pave the way in terms of establishing uh, a new benchmark as, how, as to how commercial development is supposed to be developed. Uh, interestingly enough, a lot of technologies have been put in developments uh, nowadays and this, they're not sparing any money to adopt new technologies in the development. So, in summary, the vision is to create a financial district of international distinction that is uniquely Malaysian and provide the signature high-end destination for Kuala Lumpur, create a feasible development framework and a master plan that has the ability to adapt to changing futures and to create a rich public realm, right, suitable for a variety of users, not just the Kuala Lumpur International Financial District workers, but also the residents and also the gift for the, to the public of Kuala Lumpur. They can have access to this. And also to provide educational component that links to the rich cultural and natural history of Malaysia through the design, planting and programming of the public land. Create a district that embraces sustainable goals and uh, to create striking gateway to Kuala Lumpur. Uh, create a district, a district in which the maximum number of buildings that we have here will be seen as a as a whole, as a holistic development, and to create prominent terminus, right, in terms of pedestrians uh, coming in and out of the site. We also incorporate a high quality shopping center, shopping mall within this development and also create a smart district which will incorporate state-of-the-art digital technologies. So this is it. From what was planned before, there's a lot of changes because of requirement of local authorities and also land issues that has to be accommodated. Uh, so the master plan has also changed slightly, but in terms of concept still remain. We have the central park, uh, which is accessible to everyone. So it is going to be the new CBD of Kuala Lumpur and hopefully becomes the most premium business address. This is the line.
This is the only MRT interchange center node which combines the two lines, line one and line two, right? Line one is completed. Line two is under construction at the moment. So when it's completed, they will all converge to this point. So in our planning, we studied all the movement requirement, whether it is vehicle or, or, or MRT, other public transport, and also pedestrian. So this is a, a, a diagram that shows all the various types of movement in and out of the site. For landscaping, we wanted to have the Malaysian identity. So we look at what are the features in the Malaysian identity in terms of its tradition, its culture, its treasure, and also the trade that it does. And what are the flora and fauna that is available here and see whether we could actually bring them to the site. So conceptually, the site planning for the landscape is based on the leaf. It's an abstract leaf to form or to symbolize the soft inner heart of the financial district and using it and using the growing leaf to symbolically, symbolically, symbolically represent the life and vitality of the of the project. So this is the central courtyard, so to speak, which connectivity to the Saturn site later on. So having done that, we studied as to how the whole landscaping could be developed. The requirements, it's not so easy to plant trees on the top of buildings and you have to allow ventilation because the soil that you put in, in this trough that you have, concrete trough, will also require some air circulation. And this diagram shows you how it is being done. And we have the common utility, utility tunnel. Uh, we have uh, other facilities, uh, infrastructure that is being incorporated. And in the end, this whole development is self-contained, including treatment of water and, and sewage is being recycled. So you can see here, you know, you have the tunnel and also the, the traffic that goes into the building, uh, into the whole complex, the whole 70 acres. Uh, it has been refined since we did this master plan. And uh, I will show you, show you later uh, an example of what uh, the central facilities are. So basically, it is divided in this, into these six precincts. We have the financial quarter here, the urban quarter, and then we have the lifestyle quarter, which is actually the landscaping area, which combined to, with the uh, hospitality, zone with culture and arts, uh, what we call the facilities here. And then this park quarter will be residential as well as uh, hotels. These are the apartments that's being built at the moment. And this is going to be the, or it is already the uh, TRX MRT in the MRT interchange. Um, 
this portion is not part of our, our site. It's being developed privately by another party. So here we have all the building plots. There are 30 of them. And uh, the financial modeling of this is very interesting where the company has sold the plots, almost all of them, at a very high price. On average, it's about between three to 2,000 ringgit a square foot. So they more or less recovered what the infrastructure they have put in, which, which is cost a few billion. And um, now, few buildings are being constructed, and one has been completed, or few has been completed, um, which I will show you later. So these are this retail, but above that is a is a park, the cultural center, hotel being developed, residential and offices. The plot ratio for the overall development is 7.8, but for this one is the 100 story, 106 story tower is is the plot ratio is the 13. How do you go for time? Anyway, just very quickly, this is the brand persona underpinning the registration. I just I, I just look at my watch now, it's already almost four o'clock. I just rushed through. So as I said earlier, we wanted to connect the whole area to the the Bukit Bintang. So the the landscaping is now being carried through all the way to the pavilion. So this is Tahir Gallery. If you remember, this is Fahrenheit 88. This is Jalan Gading, right? Jalan Utara here, Jalan Barat. So we have the Barat Walk. So that is the main destination. It will be a park. Here we go. The breakdown, 70 acres. Plot ratio, 7.8. We have 21,000 car park plan. And then uh, we have a typical total floor area of 24 million square feet. It's huge. 30% residential, 10% hotel, 10% retail. So that was the original plan with the park. There's a seamless movement of people. They can go up to the park. And then this was the original plan. And that's what it is going to be now. So Jadun Razak. This is the iconic tower which is completed. So basically, that's how the part is going to be. Total of 10 acres. And this is why it is now under construction for the park. So there will be a retail mall underneath and there will be a, a village walk here. Uh, this is the another apartment hotel development coming up. There is a, that, that is the, the certain portion of the site which is now left vacant is not being developed just yet. But there'll be a bridge connecting these two sites. 
you see this white patch here, this site has been allocated for a new Apple store, which will come up soon. So the new Apple store will sprout out of the landscape park later on. I had the opportunity to look at, this is the, own, the, the first of its kind, where the sewage treatment plan is for the whole area, uh, 60,000 PE, um, something like 13,500, uh, what do you call it, cubic meters per, per day, being, being treated here. So all the, the sewage will come through here, they will be sieved through and then they go through a series of, of, of pumps and, and filtration. And this is a drum that, that cleans, that cleans the, the, the effluent. And then they go through a series of, of filters. And then this will be the uh, ultraviolet lights called the reactor, all this. And then finally they come through a sand tank here. And the water is, is then recirculated back to the development area, either for purposes of, of not potable, but or drinkable water, but also for purpose of landscaping or for flushing toilets and things like that. So this will cater for the whole development. It's already been completed. And this is the quality of work, a new benchmark, or we say, for the development. This is the uh, 106 tower, main lobby, right? The entrance, main lobby, the lift lobby, even the car park, the car park is uh, uh, floors are made of finished with granite and marble holes. Um, there's no markings on the floor. It's all using projection lights. Right? So with sensors. So you don't have issues with, with, with paints and things like that. So there you are. That ends my, my presentation for today. Thank you very much. Uh, Adjanta, back to you. Yeah. Thank you, Tan Sri. I think the, the, the finest word that I can say to you in one word, this ideal is that you are defined with. <laughs> Urban planning is the profession Yeah, that concerns itself with the health and quality of life of urban places, cities, their yeah, suburbs, some small towns, rural villages, perhaps. Um, again, this is in rich history, Tansri. Even reviewed from the perspective of different uh, philosophical, ideological, and methodological approach by by yourself as a planner, as an architect, and I can consider as a social scientist, Tansri. <laughs> mm. <coughs> um, the questions now I can see from the students um, from the screen here, Tansri. I think quite yeah. interesting question from the student here. So the question is one first question here, Tansri. It was an insightful sharing and they, they enjoy it. In your point of view, what is the relationship between urban design and Malaysia highway categorization? So Malaysia what? Malaysia high categorization the highway malaysian highway and your urban design they just wonder how how you can make a bit a relationship between urban design and the those highway infrastructure how you can define that i think this is a student asking you now mm, highway highway design and infrastructure is part of urban design right Ideally, if we 
if we are doing a, a master plan, right? Um, if it's, for example, this is a new, like a new, uh, new city, completely new, right? Yeah. Like Putrajaya, for example, I think Putrajaya is a good example. There were no highway there, right? Yeah. And, uh, but because we are developing a new city, right, which will accommodate something like half a million people, uh, we need to have connectivity. So hence, the highway has been developed and been part of the whole planning process to make sure it is connected to the North-South Highway, for example. At that time, there's only North-South Highway that goes, that went through from North to South. So Putrajaya was a bit off. And later on, you know, they were alternative um, because we had to build the airport. So you got to have connectivity to the airport, airport as well. Yeah. So you had to extend the highway to the airport and then to have connectivity from the airport to people coming from the south. So you got to have connectivity there. So this is all part of urban design process, right? So I, I hope that answers the question. But if, for example, there is already existing highway, like for example, we have in the TRX, in the, <laughs> yeah. right? The issue now, how do we connect it? It is very difficult to do it. Um, I didn't show you the plan, the, the detailed plan, yeah. but there are bypasses that has to be built to be built. If you go to Jalan Tung Raza now, you'll find that there is a bypass, which is a, an elevated highway uh, that will take you. It doesn't take you to the to the TRX. It takes you away from it, you know, for you to go to the south to connect to the Max Highway. But the existing highway, the existing road, Jalan Tung Raza, will then dive into the uh, the TRX, you know, into the basement. And in the basement, there is a series of tunnels uh, for you to make make sure you have access to all the different plots. So it's a very difficult um, strata title arrangement. So right. these are issues that we have to to look at. Um, you know, there are there are master plan at various levels, right, in underground. Yeah. It's, so is this? Uh, it's it's not just a simple site planning. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You have to think of planning it vertically, not just exactly horizontally. Uh, not just horizontal. You know, in three, you have to think in three dimension. So, uh, but thank right. God now, now you have you have program like Revit. You know, BIM. BIM, Revit yeah. Correct, so, correct. I think I agree with you, Tansri. It's not easy, but we have to be a thorough uh, analysis, yeah, synthesis. Uh, the second question here, Tansri, from Miss Vinci Lai, is urban design planning principles, yeah, policy directions and urban strategies that could be useful to guide cities as they seek transition to sustainable path? Yeah, of course. You know, when you, when you, uh, develop i show you a very simple fundamental menu just now right five of them when you go if you go deeper there are things that you have to do for example now i know uh, you have to uh, make sure that you attain your objective in 2050 the zero carbon you know yeah. mm. carbon neutral so what do you do you know um, so there are there are methods as to how you calculate, you know, your carbon carbon footprint uh, for the development, and this we are doing that for some projects at the moment. So it is very important. Uh, I saw quite interesting presentation by Dr. Ken Yang, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. About biodiversity and things like that. I think biodiversity and uh, greenery and greening the neighborhood 
will become the order of the day, right? People like to be healthier now, right? Uh, so the the less, the only thing that we we are still grappling at the moment, we're still depending so much on fossil fuel, yeah. it, even to to run our our air conditioning system, right? We depend on fossil fuel because they are the ones that generate the electricity. So until and when we, we go to renewable energy, then the things will not be, you know, the same. Yeah, yeah. related to that, Tan Sri, hmm. how far should urban design go into, into this post-COVID-19 era? What's your opinion about it? You know, interestingly enough, yesterday I was, the last three days I was attending the Kazana mega trends. COVID-19 becoming a real topic of this of debate, discussion. Yeah. Um, you know, in urban design, right, basically at the moment, the responsibility of making sure that you are protected against any kind of virus or disease is to make sure you're healthy. Correct. Right? So there must be a lot more spaces for people to be able to recreate, do their exercises or, or what have you, you know, and uh, lead a very healthy lifestyle. Professor Adiba was saying that, you know, you cannot depend on the hospitals and the KKM to, you know, to to solve a problem of health. Uh, health is starts from your home. So, which means, the design of your houses also must take into account. You know, there's proper ventilation, natural ventilation, and this is something I find that even in our affordable homes, uh, the design is not catering for that. Our traditional low cost or medium cost houses now is not properly ventilated. There's not enough cross ventilation when you have, you know, regimented block, uh, lots, you know, in a very specific rigid plan. So there must be a, a change yeah. So some ideas that what uh, Dr. Ken has mentioned earlier and some work done by Woha in Singapore, right? Yeah. Uh, I think it's brilliant. We got to have, you know, you, you go along the highway at the moment, you see a lot of houses, a lot of blocks or apartments uh, with no balconies. They just, they just boxes with holes, right? But you compare that with with uh, HDB flats in Singapore, right? It's much different because your your balconies are facing out, your corridors are facing out instead of facing into the air well, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know that I think <laughs> we have our architects have to start thinking, you know, how to reverse it. Well, corridors are, are very important, not, not, not just access, but they are, they, are, they are areas for people to, to connect, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's pretty common it's area, common country. Country. Yeah, but it's too narrow at the moment. Too narrow, too narrow. small. small. Yeah. Mm. By the time you put your shoes and slippers, and there's no more space. Exactly. Right. <laughs> from that note, Tansri, there's a question from Mr. Ahmad Shwe. Uh, it is good to have new development area, but mm. how? How about the surrounding area? Some looks too old, and he said negative view. So, is there something architect can do the neighborhood area? Actually, from what I understand. Uh, City Hall has already embarked on uh, a scheme uh, where they were, they, I mean, 
they, 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 they're starting now. They were yeah. actually pretty beautify, let's say the sidewalk, right? And then a certain amount of fees or, or levy will be charged to the building owner. Yeah. Uh, like in the, what we experienced in, in, in Bukit Bintang is, that is happening now. And uh, so Jalan Gading, which is which connects to the TRX now, is being developed. And the owner or the plot themselves willingly to, you know, to beautify the area. Like, for example, the side of Star Hill and the side of, of uh, Apani. What's the other one? They are, they are opening up to have al fresco mm -hmm. dining things like that you know yeah yeah so so it become very vi vibrant and and also uh, uh, beautiful with landscape and things like that yeah so i agree with you eh? i agree with you Tansi. like for example yeah, malaysian culture they love to to sit down at the al fresco dining outdoor mm. you know they love to do that especially now because you you know when when in dining is being limited because of right. SOP. SOP, so, yeah. So, government is encouraging people, restaurants to have outdoor. Correct. Uh, <laughs> so, we, I can see the the outdoor alfresco dining will be, you know. More popular. <laughs> more popular from now on. <clears throat> We believe a greater empathy with nature will improve our inner urban lives so our architecture is in harmony with the planet and the people who live and work on it. So the question now, how to integrate this in Malaysia, Tansri? You know, <laughs> since the pandemic, since the lockdown, I've become a, a gardener. <laughs> I started planting, you know, vegetables and things like that. And I tell you what, you know, it is very, very soothing, uh, you know, to be able to have access to this. So, like, um, I think it's very important, like in Europe, where you're living in an apartment, flats, but there's a plot of land next door that you're yep. given, right, for you to be closer to nature so you you have your own garden you know plot so maybe it's something that we have to think about you know here so even if we don't have a garden plot you maybe have to have a a, a garden plot and on the top the roof, mm, the roof. Yeah? so something which the developers have to think about to you know so we have more greenery we have people who are more active, you know, to do urban farming, right? So yeah, yeah. it's something that we architects can start thinking how to incorporate all this in the design. Yeah. Maybe I put in one last question, Tansi. I think this is a favorite question. What what's your opinion? Yeah. What impact do planners have on the communities in which they are work? That's it. What impact planner has on the community? In which they work now. Yeah, because I, I think it's very important for planners, or even architects for that matter, right? Yeah. When they do a plan, a master plan, they have to engage the community. In all our work, right, with DG, when we do a plan, we engage the community. We actually have uh, charades with, with, with the community to find out no, what is their, their feeling and thinking? Because at the end of the day, they are the one are the stakeholders. You know, mm -hmm. we are not going to dictate right, what they are supposed to do, but we have to take their requirement and analyze their requirements and transform it into something which they themselves will be able to buy in. Mm -hmm. But uh, we don't dictate so much. You know, we. In a way, you can say that because of our expertise, we facilitate for them yeah. you know, to realize what is the best in terms of the environment that they should be in. Right, right. 
It's a very insightful presentation thanks to you today. I mean, creativity and innovation is to events. What the heart and soul is to the living now. So, Tansi, yes. any final word to, to, can you share to all the Malaysian architecture students here from mm. you? Yeah, any advice or any final words from you? Yeah, I think maybe but as far as students are concerned, um, if I were a student, um, I would like to, you know, just be open-minded and be receptive yeah. to whatever is around you, and uh, you know, do a lot of a lot of research, a lot of reading, you know, to see what is out there and what is coming, and I think I think. Um, you know, I, when I, I saw the, the, the program on, on Kazana's web mega trends, we are not short of talents, young, young talents. And uh, it's, it, it's really amazing. Uh, it's really amazing. And I, I believe the students that we have and even the, the, the graduates that we have in, in our institute, yes. they are really an eye-opener even for a person like me. Uh, so um, I try to be open-minded as well, you know, but I think with the young ones, they open my mind a lot more. <laughs> so I think stop, don't stop searching, right? And uh, do what you want to do. Yeah. I think that's fine, yeah. Yeah. It looks like a symbiosis system now, Tansri. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's why I consider, I always call them as the next generation architect. They are future architects. Thank you so much, Tansri, sir, um, for your you. contributions. It's a very inspiring, informative and insightful sharing. And I, I truly hope that the students or even the viewers here, you know, be inspired and and then keep moving forward to improve our building industry, especially our our Malaysian architecture and urban design industry. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much Tansri. <laughs> <laughs> well, students, uh, viewers, design a thing by considering it in its next larger context. A chair in a room, a room in a house, a house in the community, and a community in the city. So, I wish you all the best. Be safe. Thank you so much, Tansri. And I'll pass back the floor to our MC, Miss Crystal, Crystal, yeah, from Masa. Thank you, Tansri. Thank you. Thank you so Crystal. much. All right. Thank you so much, Architect Ajanta and Tansri Esa. It was such a blessing that you shared your knowledge to inspire the students and young architects. And you're right. Being open-minded and perspective is definitely a key to a fruitful journey. All right, this marks the end of our talk today. Thank you to all the audiences for marking our day with your attendances. We look forward to seeing you in our next talk. A very big thank you to our very special guests, Tan Sri Architect Esa and Architect Adrianta Aziz, our moderator, with the rest of the team for bringing this session to fruition. Lastly, but definitely not least, it is, has been a great opportunity to have this collaboration with Pam and Architects in Architects Online 2021. We are delighted to have your company. Do keep in touch and follow us on Masa's Instagram and Facebook page for more updates and do check out Architects Online for more interesting webinar sessions. Also, if you haven't done it already, you can also register for PEM membership at www.mypem.org.my. There are a lot of benefits awaits for architecture students. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy. We'll catch you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Be well. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.